My name is Stanley E. Cromwell. I am a Guyanese-born contemporary artist. Michael Breeder, artist, decorator. Jean-Dominique Volsi, visual artist. My name is Maurice Jacob, one of the Guyanese artists. My name is David G. Wilson, visual pun, which is the style in which I, I, I paint. I call it anthropomorphic perception. My name is Claude Hoyt. I work for art instruction schools. This is the way I can express myself by painting. My name is Jerry Barry, presently a teacher. Herbert Glenn Bennett. I'm an architect, artist, industrial designer, educator, writer. My name is Lennox Warner. I'm a sculptor from an island of Montserrat. My name is Carlton Morell. I am from the island of Barbados, visual artist, art consultant, and art teacher. One thing that all of my paintings have is the symbolism. There is a lot of symbolism in my work. Caribbean art cannot be defined. My art is inclusive of the Caribbean. It's not stereotypical of the Caribbean. It's expressionist, some, sometimes it's a little abstract. Abstract, expressionism, realism, surrealism. It's like a gumbo. Being from the Caribbean, colors is very linguistic. I find a certain excitement in painting the feeling of light, light on color, the feeling of atmosphere. I give it the way I feel it. So it's a spiritual thing. It's emotion. You get, you get a visceral kind of re reaction from it. Be more expressive, be more out there. We're real. And as a Caribbean artist, I find that when I travel to the Caribbean, there is a whole lot to be done. There's a whole other world out there beyond the art world. We are the new things that's waiting to happen. The way people see making a name for themselves is actually earning a lot of money. I've seen artists get pretty depressed when they don't sell. If you go to an exhibit with the premise that you're not going to sell, but that you're there so that all the people that are there can just see your work and see your name, you've won. Don't let the lack dearth of sales interfere with your production of work. Do art for you. Make you feel good about yourself. When somebody tell you, Michael Brunner, they say, yes, that's me. Oh my goodness, you're lying. When you look at it, you say, I did that. Yeah, I got that. I got that. Hey, I like that. This color is very nice. Your composition, what? And then your friends come and look over and say, hey, how'd you do that? Makes you feel good about you. No money, but I'm happy. This is in fact an industry. This is in fact a profession. You can't be wanting to be successful and be hiding in a closet at the same time. We can't just wait for people to find us. Artists by themselves cannot be a business. We must be willing to share what we learn. It's a gift from God and therefore I have to share it. That's a lesson that the majority of the Caribbean artists have not learned. The Caribbean population is very small, so the bigger the population and the wealthier the population, the more funds and exposure they get within that group. Different cultures and how they approach things, they have that kind of cultural, economic infrastructure in place. It's not just a question of just making the artwork. You have to put in as much time to market your artwork. Every group does that. When we come to community consciousness, and we begin to understand the supporting networks that's needed, everything changes. But once we continue to look and pick of each other in enclaves, we will continue to perpetuate the same mess that we are complaining against. My name is Carlton Morell. I am from the island of Barbados, visual artist, art consultant, and art teacher. Uh, my teaching experience is with New York City Housing Authority, and I've been with that program now for at least 10 years. From early teenage life, I was in Barbados. While in high school, I would always be fiddling and fooling around with drawings and any experiences that I can gain from other people already in the field. 
and I will always find myself going to several exhibitions and so on, and learning from the, the more experienced artists. And then my family came here to the United States between 1966, which is our, our year of independence from the England. I was a scholarship holder at the Art Students League where I studied for a couple of years, and then started full-time painting from about 1976, during which time I entered into a lot of outdoor shows, gallery shows. It brought me mainstream into the, the echelon of the bigger art world. My work has been shown at the Brooklyn Museum, and presently where we are standing, this is a place where it's housing some more Afrocentric artists. We have an exhibition from this space called Arcurian. Arcurian now has an exhibition at the Hempstead Museum, which is the National Afro-American Museum in Hempstead. I enjoy painting with oils, watercolors, pastels. I seem to balance my sense of skills in any, any of those, those genres, be it a landscape, a figurative painting, be it a portrait, and I do them with some degree of professionalism. We have amongst us uh, Otto Neils, uh, Emmett Wigglesworth, um, also, uh, Donovan Nelson is a great painter. He kind of slides in and out of realism. Stan Cromwell, a great, great friend of mine for many years, is a great painter. Uh, our styles are very different, but he has a deep inner sense of connecting to the inner side of himself. There's this guy called Ernest Critchlow, who is Caribbean as well, between Barbados and Jamaica. I've gone to Jamaica and seen some of the great things done by the Jamaican artists there as well. My work has been seen and known in Europe as well. The European artists, the Impressionists, what they put out is what I feel, atmosphere, a sense of atmosphere, a sense of color, a sense of luminosity. This moment in time lends itself to the particular item that is being painted. I find a certain essence, a certain excitement in painting the feeling of light, light on color, the feeling of atmosphere. I give it the way I feel it. So it's a spiritual thing. It lends to a feeling of luminosity, a feeling of tranquility, meditation, contemplation, anything of that sort. I feel that the, the realists have made their mark. I am more interested in giving you a, a larger view, but a view that pretty much poses the feeling that I have about that particular piece. It must have some meaning to that person who wants to own it, how much it means when he or she wakes up in the morning and walk into their living room and they look at the piece and ah, it's a breath of fresh air. <laughs> uh, coming from work, he or she finds themselves encumbered by a lot of the experiences on the job that are usually at times not as positive as they would like it to be and that piece tends to just unwind them. It's a gift from God, and therefore I have to share it. A piece, I work very rapidly sometimes. It may take me just about six to eight sessions. It's like a moment in time. If I stretch it out and labor on it, I don't feel it any longer. I find the joy here because it is many cultures. There is a blessing coming here. But yet, at the same time, as a Caribbean artist, I do feel that we, while we are contributing, we need to get more recognition for that contribution internationally. I think we have a lot to offer in those areas. The big art collectors who want Caribbean art would bypass the United States and go straight to the Caribbean and get perhaps what they feel is the real thing there. So it might be that there is a feeling uh, within the, the, the collector's minds that if it's got to be Caribbean, I got to go to the Caribbean for it. We, as Caribbean artists, may have to deny, <laughs> literally deny, sort of rebirth ourselves. And as a Caribbean artist, I find that when I travel to the Caribbean, um, there is a whole lot to be done. I always think international, think successful. And in spite of what might happen to the shoulders of those on whom they stand, always think that yours is going to be bigger and better.
My name is Stanwyck E. Cromwell. I am a Guyanese-born contemporary artist who has lived and worked in the United States for over 40 years. Currently, I'm an adjunct professor at Capital Community College at Teeth Caribbean Art and Culture. Guyana has played a very important role in my work because um, even though I do not live in Guyana currently, my memories of Guyana are very rich and abundant. I came to America to pursue lab technician. Being an artist was not considered a real job, wasn't considered something that you could use to provide for your family. When I was doing you know, biology or chemistry, I spent most of my time in the artistic creation in terms of drawing the flowers, drawing the plants, drawing the human body. It was more art to me than actual biology. My father's a graphic artist and I started out being a graphic artist. I think my experience as a graphic artist laid the foundation for who I am today and the type of art I do because graphic art helps you deal with proportions, laying out compositions. If you look at a lot of my work, you see um, a lot of geometric shapes, a lot of angles, a lot of lines. I would say inherited the gift of art from my father, but I was nurtured by my cousin, Maurice Jacobs, who happens to be an artist and also my mentor. I got my bachelor's degree at Charter Oak State College in New Britain, Connecticut, and my MFA, my Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Hartford Art School. I moved to Connecticut from New York in 1975. And Connecticut at that time was a very quiet town. It allowed me that peace and tranquility to really focus on my art. A lot of my um, influence sometimes were European style of painting because in Guyana or the Caribbean, uh, most of the models we saw or the artists were European. Rembrandt, Van Gogh, and some of the other local artists, American artists I was influenced by was Jacob Lawrence, Romare Bearden, and uh, Elizabeth Catlett. Every artist goes through a process of, of imitation. I was uh, continuing painting in the traditional style, and all of a sudden I just had this desire to show my true colors. Being from the Caribbean, colors is very linguistic. Most things or people are described by colors. Um, let's say, for instance, someone is looking for you. They may not know your name, but you have on a blue shirt. You drive a blue car or a green car. To most Caribbean artists, it's, it's a natural thing. Colors has been something that I was embedded in my subconscious for quite a while and I wasn't even aware that it was there. It's part of my DNA. It's something that, uh, it's a natural mystic. My first art exhibition was, I would say, somewhat of uh, becoming of age. I was trusted into the art scene with a couple of uh, accomplished artists. I had this raw talent, but no way to challenge it in, in terms of what makes one a professional artist. And a lot of the artists I was showing at was, was, were artists that had notoriety. I had a lot of work, but it was disorganized. I hadn't let learn the craft of art because there is creating art and then there's the craft of art in terms of um, how do you present your work as a body. Art has to present it like food. You want the food, like how food uh, appeals to the palate. You should not leave the exhibition the same way you come in. You should either be happy, sad, or pissed off. artist. He studied at the Art Institute of Boston. He studied um, illustration. I remember him being a little kid and uh, just doing a bit of scribble dibble. And I remember taking him to little museums. And all of a sudden he graduated from high school and he said that I want to, um, I want to take up art. And it was like, it was like something that he wasn't certain of in terms of um, being an artist, knowing that art is not something that um, you could depend on as a daily income. But he was honest to his feeling and he um, went on to, um, to become an artist and in his short lifetime he did some wonderful work. Of course his work was different from, from mine and I, I believe at time there was in the struggle as an African-American artist with Caribbean born parents what society would want your work to look like in terms of um, uh, your work has to look like your father but I, I was very happy to know that he grew into his own likeness and image. He grew into his own style. Being an artist of Caribbean descent and trying to make it an art world is a lot of pressure because there is a lot of stereotype and dogmas as it pertains to Caribbean art. The painting is not uh, intended to be 
quote or a painting that stereotypes the Caribbean. My work has changed from that. My work is subject to individual interpretation. I am a Caribbean-born artist, but I do not consider my, my art Caribbean. Um, you see some of these colors are referenced in the fruits that are grown in the Caribbean. You see the plums, the purple, the tangerine, the oranges, the green plantains. I think Caribbean art could only be defined by the honesty of the artist and the composition. The Caribbean is divided into four languages, French, Spanish, Dutch, and English. Sometimes I'm caught up in a territorial or a geographic dispute. What makes you Caribbean artist or Caribbean-born artist? You're from Guyana, which is South America, but you are still considered Caribbean. So I think Caribbean art cannot be defined. Now, this painting here is for an exhibition in Brooklyn, New York. It's part of the mural series. This is part two of the mural series. And I choose this, this particular um, topic because this composition deals with um, the imagination. It's called Imaginary Marketplace in Brooklyn, New York, but it's not your typical marketplace. It's more of a dream, um, a surreal dream. The fruits and vegetables could be whatever you want it to be. In other words, um, I have created a world of illusion, a, a world of make-believe. I'm inspired by possibilities. I'm inspired by the simple things of maybe a, a raindrop, the rain falling on the roof. Uh, the birds singing or chirping. It's individual interpretation. It's what you see in it, not what I say it is. In other words, um, I call this a mango. Another person may want to call it uh, an avocado. It, it doesn't matter what the fruit is. I'm not concerned about um, any mistake I make along the way because once you try to correct the mistakes in terms of colors or, or lines or whatever, it seems as though you're trying to create um, perfection and I do not want to create perfection. I want to create a piece of art in which you can see that the artist was not perfect. Um, he has some flaws. And that's what art is about to me. It's about showing my flaws, but let it become part of the creativity. To, for me, creating art is more of a mental and spiritual thing than it is physical, because when I'm creating art, I'm not tired. I'm never tired, as a matter of fact, the more I paint, the more energetic I become. My art has been influenced by a variety of cultures. Abstract, expressionism, realism, surrealism. It's like a gumbo. It's inclusive of the Caribbean. It's not stereotypical of the Caribbean. You, you are who you are. You cannot hide from yourself. Stay true to your craft. 10 years from now, I see myself creating a whole new body of work. I think my best work is yet to come. I feel um, that I have a surplus amount of creative energy that 10 years from now I would be experiencing a renaissance. My name is uh, Jean Dominique Volsi, and I am a visual artist, and I've been doing this for the past uh, 30 years. And like you see, when you that, you know, I really feel comfortable with what I'm doing now. When I, uh, probably when I was able to hold a pencil, I guess that's when I started drawing. But for the sake of it, I can tell you that, uh, from time I remember when I was at least uh, 12, 12 years old, when I was, you know, start drawing, make, using watercolor, and making some greeting cards, you know, and that was my start. When it comes to inspiration, I think that's something very personal. Because uh, your work is like your fingerprint. My work is though, it's like expressionist. Expressionism is like uh, I can you know, describe my work. And uh, that's where I feel, you know, like uh, I can discover stuff that, you know, I really want to put out. You can force yourself to become either an abstract artist or a surrealist artist, you know, that's you. You build up, you know, like, like I said, this is your, this is you, this is your personality that, you know, you, tr you see through the work, the work of art. My personal life, people that I see, event, uh, whatever touch my heart, something that make you sad, thing that make you happy, 
everything that turn, can turn my own. When I go to my exhibit, like uh, there's people always ask me you know, about uh, to give the, them some type of explanation of my work, you know, some detailed explanation or something. When I go to my exhibit, I become also a student. I want to stand by someone looking at my work and then hear what they see. And this is on the process of learning again. I was part, going to be part of an exhibit at the, the Brooklyn Museum. I was part of a group. Then uh, people were looking at what I was doing. They said, look, I don't feel they're going to fit in that museum because, you know, they don't like what I did. So I said to myself, look, if someone, if you can be part of it, I can be part of it as well. When they see that place that was planned to exhibit at the museum, and they look at it, they didn't believe that I did it. And that was, that painting I kept it like uh, a step ladder, you know, for everything that I do because I believe that you can do it. I have no complaint when it comes to feedback because people do like my work. They always wonder, how did you make that? Especially when uh, I was making uh, that, uh, that African uh, a woman, that beauty, and they asked me, you know, them, you know, we're not on earth when you were making that painting. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a living, just like everybody else. It just, you know, when I'm working, you know, I become part of my work. Do that painting and me, we make, we make one. So this is what helped me out to, to, come, to create. I do acrylic painting, I do oil painting, I do watercolor, I do itching. Uh, sometimes I try on sculpture and mahogany. And I do some type of mixed media also. Because it depends how I feel, you know, how to want to, uh, uh, when you have an idea or something you want to come out, you know, sometimes you, know, you can use oil something here to be a mix of everything else that's, I don't know in the future, I might go even further. I personally feel that I have accomplished a lot. After all those 30 years, I did a lot. And I see me going, in, you know, from a baby, like, you know, artist, you know, and now what I'm doing is that I satisfy myself. That's my, that's the main thing. When you're talking about cabaret and artists, I feel that uh, being an artist is already a challenge. It's hard work. It's not that easy to make it. No matter who you are, either from the Caribbean, or from Europe, or whatever. But you have to do your homework. The best advice I can give them is like, first of all, you have to not lag. You have to love what you're doing. Be at it every day, if you can. Go out there, you know, see what the other artists are doing, go to exhibit, and when you get a chance to exhibit your work, don't hold on, you know, just show your work. And be part of the family. You have to be connected with the artists. It's a long road. And that road, you know, sometimes you, know, you might fall, but you got to remember that it happened. And you got to stand up again and keep on going and do it right. My name is David G. Wilson. I include the G because there are several, that name is very common. It began with my mother. When she was teaching my brother and me to read, she asked my brother to identify the map of Italy. And as he hesitated, she gave him a hint that just lit up my mind. She said, Italy is kicking Sicily. And when I looked at the map, I said, yes, that does look like a, a boot kicking a ball. And I said, Ma, Dominica looks like a penguin. And Guadeloupe looks like a butterfly. From that point, whenever I would look at any image, I would look for an alternative reality in it. My father once asked me, what do you want to be? And I, I made the big mistake of telling him, I want to be an artist. Artist die poor. He never saw any of my paintings. From childhood, I was always influenced by Sparrow. I loved Sparrow's lyric. What I liked was the, the fact that he could sing one line with multiple meanings. Granted, we all know what Sparrow was singing about. So that pushed me more and more into the, the, the idea of double meanings. The final catalyst was reading something that Leonardo da Vinci, he says that the artist who wishes to enhance his faculties for creative invention can look at a stain on the wall and therein see whatever he wants to see. I said, whoa, I was, I found what I'm looking for. I took photograph of the Mona Lisa and I started looking. 
I said there must be something hidden in that that makes it so mysterious because from uh, from childhood I've been hearing the Mona Lisa is mysterious and I said there must be something hidden in there that I can find and so far I've done six different versions of the Mona Lisa each in each one seeing an alternate a completely different alternate rea uh, alternative reality within there the conclusion I came to is that if he suggested it, he must have practiced it. So Da Vinci has been the major. Although I discovered Salvador Dali painting visual pun, which is the style in which I, I, I paint. But he didn't latch on to that style as his main thing. So I decided to latch on to that style and produce as many, or as I say, alternative realities within images. So I have done um, many old master paintings to show that I can see an alternative reality in it. I call it anthropomorphic perception. For example, one that I use quite a lot is the hand of bananas. It looks like a human hand. So um, whenever you see the hand of bananas in my paintings, it is a deferential reference to my father because he worked in the banana industry in my country. So I use the hand of banana to represent the hand that fed me, my father. When I used to use the subway a lot, I was looking at people and I'd begin to see alternative realities in their face. I couldn't stop painting if I wanted to. From childhood, I've always been drawing, painting, so it's not something I could ever walk away from. And in many, on many occasions, I've painted at least three paintings in one day. Mm -hmm. I started off painting with oil, oil paints, but then uh, in this small house, um, especially in the winter time, the smell became uh, so obnoxious because the windows are closed. So I switched to acrylic paint and I enjoy it. My colleagues, my, my colleagues, I, I, I like Jerry Barry, Carlton Murrell, Dominic Volsi. I love his work too. Um, there's another Haitian sculptor that I just love his work. Uh, his name is Maxi St. Felix. The way people see making a name for themselves is actually earning a lot of money but my, my main goal is to create a large body of work. I have seen artists get pretty depressed when, depressed when they don't sell. So I make art, painting, my objective really. I keep a job so that I, can, I don't have to worry about, about that. And getting into the main galleries, they were not looking for what I'm, I'm producing. And I'm, I'm not prepared to alter my style or paint what somebody else wants me to paint then I, it, would, it, would mean, it would not mean anything to me. I was once told, this is not art. In fact, there were two witnesses who, who were there when she said that, Carlton Mirel and Otto Niels. And she looked at my work and, this is not art. I asked her, what, what's your criterion of art? Line, form and color, I say, is that what they taught you at graduate school? <laughs> so I, I'm, not, I'm not bothered about criticism of somebody believing that my work is not art. I know what I'm, pro I'm doing. My goal is actually to transcend the third dimension in art. For 500 years, since the re early Renaissance, Western artists have been able to depict three-dimensional illusion on a two-dimensional surface. Physicists tell you that uh, there are 11, at least 11 spatial dimensions. My goal is to transcend the third dimension. Using perspective, I have managed to replicate a three-dimensional illusion, um, incorporated an alternative reality, which I think is another dimension. What I have come to realize, the mainstream does not want to see any, anything positive from black artists. And I'll be damned if I do that. If that's what I, it will take to get recognition, I don't want it. I'm, I will produce what my mind's eye sees, okay? And there are quite a few prominent artists now producing this type of stuff, and it ticks me off. But if this is what I have to do to gain success, I don't want success. My advice to any artist is to simply produce a body of work. Eventually, somebody will see what you're doing, okay? Come up with ideas about what you can do with your work. But don't let the lack, dearth of sales um, interfere with your production of work. Okay, what you shall produce 
will be more, more, much more pure than the financially driven work. The quality of their work will suffer if you focus mainly on, I must sell a penny. No. Produce what your gut tells you to produce. And the quality of your work will certainly show up. My name is Michael Brunner, and uh, I'm artist, decorator, and calligraph. Now I have uh, 65, 45 heels I paint. On the beginning, a, a very ancient art uh, at 75% uh, is beginning onto the landscaping. And call primitive or naive after to the school and to go to many, many, many gallery and many country. And I start to have now the something to very, very strong that's like beginning to now that the expression is. After you go to the uh, the modern to have now the expressionist, but the modern is better to me when I'm beginning to uh, drawing something. And after that, the expression is coming back for to the color and to have expressionist uh, or between expressionist and impressionist. Anything to, to anything to pass on my on my mind, on movie, the family, when something to happen, and automatically the inspiration is coming and I can't find this. You have many problems, because some art gallery don't accept you. That's the first thing. And the second though, you need more money to put your art onto the exposition at somewhere. And Tercio, you have, you don't have uh, the leader to put you out on this movement. The problem to uh, money is the first thing. Where, when you have money first, you can't to impose you, you can't impose your art at nobody. Or sometimes when you look somebody to paint and you look your painter, you better. But nobody care you. That's the problem you can't have. You can't eat every day. But to have the good morning, to have some, some art is going up, but depend the day, depend the month, depend your, uh, your star on the sky. I have uh, many experience about for the exposition. The first, I think when I work on 80 or uh, at uh, this epoch uh, 20 years ago and you have your exposition on my art gallery, on my studio and you see the tourists is coming and you can't uh, buy five or six paintings on the same day. The good experience that the first day on the Friday at six o'clock the exposition is coming, and you sell one painting for $5,000 and finish. And you can say, okay, that's not bad. That's my experience is sometimes good, sometimes bad. When, when somebody tell you, Michael Brunet, I say, yes, that's me. Oh my goodness, your line, your color, and you say, I'm really good. And he said, oh, Michael, this color is very nice. Your proposition, what, you know, it is good. No money, but I'm happy. You're supposed to have God with you. You're supposed to have some chance. You're supposed to have somebody you can talk. And to have friend 
the good friend who can help you. Good friendship, you know, respect, you know, love. Everything is perfect every time. It gives me the push I need. I cannot remember a time that I did not draw. I have pen been painting all my life. Somebody kind of asked me, what is the earliest thought, the earliest um, remembrance that I have of um, drawing? And the only thing that I can remember is that when I was must have been maybe four years old. I was eating a mango that was particularly fibrous. I remember taking that mango and making a little, after eating it, making little hands and little feet. And I took a charcoal, because that's what we cook with in Haiti. I took a piece of charcoal and drew a little eye and uh, a little mouth. And I remember that this probably was my earliest memory of drawing and uh, from that moment on it continued people knew that i loved it because i am self-taught i did not have a professor that i could emulate i did not have um, the guidance that some other people have however i am particularly enamored so to speak with the Renaissance painters, Raphael and um, Michelangelo. When I go to Rome and I look at the Sistine Chapel, I'm in awe and I want to do the same. And I guess that's where it comes. My style, it's expressionist, some, sometimes it's a little abstract. One thing that all of my paintings have is the symbolism. There is a lot of symbolism in my work, and it means something with the life of Haiti. When you look at it, the colors are Haitian, so a style is something that gets developed as the artist grows in his or her art. This is probably what happens with most artists. When they pick up the brush, it's emotion. It's what they're feeling at that time that they're putting on the canvas. Every art form is valid, whether it is abstract, whether it is modern, which, whatever it is, it has its value there. Coming from that, it's what technique does the artist use it is really at the preference of the artist. Everything inspires me to paint. I meet somebody in the street and the face is impregnated in my mind and very possibly it will come out on one of my paintings. Something with uh, the local news that strikes me and a painting comes out from there. I dream about something and a painting comes out. My friends, music, all, everything just inspires me to paint. The Haitian artist finds it very, very difficult to make a name because you'll go through the streets of Haiti, a lot of art, very often it will be art that's replicated because they want to sell that piece of art so quickly and they will sell it for nothing. They don't have the time to wait and perfect a style. On the other hand, if you analyze some of these street paintings, some of them are really, really nice. It's very difficult to make a living as an artist, even, even if it's not a Caribbean artist, even American artist. If I had to give an advice, you have to spend as much time painting as you do the business of art. This is what I do every single day. I wake up in the morning and I go up to my studio and I paint. I left my work and I started painting because I realized that I had to do it sometime. And very often that's a lesson that the majority of the Caribbean artists have not learned. 
to go and put themselves out to go and sell themselves. They haven't learned that yet, and I think that's something that they need to learn. We can't just wait for people to find us. We have to go. You have to enter competition. You have to go and visit galleries. You have to get your name out there. I launched myself in the public market about, oh, six years ago. About up to maybe 2,500 you know, in six years that I've painted in six years. So I'm not afraid to, to be rejected. If you go to an exhibit with the premise that you're not going to sell, but that you're there so that all the people that are there can just see your work and see your name, you've won. And it's that one person that makes a difference. Most of my sales have happened after the exhibit. They go home and they say, I think that rental piece would go well here. Call me, they buy the piece. It's that road that leads you to the next step. The other advice that I would give is not to price your art too high. You always want your art to do better. Make believe that the artwork that you're selling for $50 is really worth a hundred dollars but you're paying the person fifty dollars to exhibit it and advertise it in their home for you because there's going to be a lot of people going in the home of that person looking at your painting and wanting one so that's really the advice that i would give a budding artist caribbean artist and believe in yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am a Caribbean artist, and Caribbean art is valued out there, and I am going to do my darndest to put my name out there. My name is Lennox Warner. I'm an artist. I'm a mixed media artist. I'm originally from the West Indies, from an island of Montserrat. I would say I started doing this in my, um, I guess in my late 50s. I'm a sculptor and I work with many different materials to uh, produce a piece of artwork. Uh, casting, bronze and glass casting and a um, whole host of different materials that I work with. I did paint years ago when I was first starting but now I just don't do painting by itself. My painting is included in my uh, art overall. I have a, a really vivid imagination and I have a large imagination and I don't want to be confined to the material that I use. In other words, I don't want to be confined to uh, the media, medium. Of The medium may be paint, the medium may be wood, the medium may be bronze, the medium may be glass. I can work with electrical work, I can work with a certain amount of video work, which I'm including some of my mixed media uh, artwork right now. So. Um, I like to reach out and experiment. I don't want to be confined to the medium. The way I see it is this. Mediums usually belong to certain areas. Like if you grew up in a place where there's a lot of carvable rocks or stones, I would say, um, that's where that medium was really involved. Say in Egypt, where there was a lot of carvable limestone, that's what they did, they carved that. If you are from West Africa, where there's a lot of carvable trees, you carved that. If you are from certain parts of Europe where there's a lot of pigment but not a lot of either one, you did a lot of painting because the pigment was readily available. But in this day and age with so many, all these mediums are very available to you, especially in the New York region, it's good to sort of spread out and, and use different mediums. I want to use the medium to produce the artwork that I, uh, I define. It comes to me as an imagination which I see it fully finished and I just have to complete it. I think I have a lot of good feedbacks, a lot of people who's trying to, still trying to figure out what I'm doing and it's, it's not unusual because the kind of artwork I do, I don't, I'm not a copy artist, I think I'm an inventive artist and I'm a creative artist and I create from, hopefully from scratch. Personally, I like the um, the masquerade, the masquerade uh, artists, that people who do the uh, carnivals, and uh, there's many of them like that who, who are involved in that. Unknown, unsung artists who just do it every year. 
Well, there's many non-visual artists like Jeffrey Holder and uh, a lot of other artists like that. Gene Basquad is one. Um, one of the things I find with um, artists, the biggest, usually the biggest ethnic group or the larger ethnic group support their own. The Caribbean population is very small, so the bigger the population and the wealthier the population, the more funds and um, exposure they get within that group. Every group does that. I do have support within the Caribbean population that I belong to. And it's, it's just uh, the larger the population, the, uh, the bigger support that you do have. I really don't have a problem in the Atlantic City area where I live. Um, I'm very well known there and I really don't have a problem getting an exhibition there. Um, getting one in New York, it's, it's harder, it's more competitive and um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work to get, it, get an exhibition in, uh, in this area where I really, you know, I grew up in New York so I, I need to be here. I think everybody in this modern age, in this day and age, is looking for newness, looking for something new. And I think that's one of the things that the Caribbean artist has to offer, is that newness. And because we haven't had that exposure, we'll, we're the new things that's waiting to happen. I look at it this way, there's 24 hours in a day, so that leaves me the rest of the time either to run around or do artwork, and most of the times I just do artwork. I think I've probably worked straight through like 18 hours in a piece, one piece. Particularly um, when I'm wood carving, that's very labor intensive and I have to spend a lot of time because you can't make a mistake if you're wood carving, you cannot add it back on. One piece it took me six years to complete and it wasn't that I wasn't working on it all the time, it's just I, could, hadn't, I wasn't able to figure it out all the time what exactly what I needed to do. I can always visualize what, a, what a, something is going to look like at the end. I can see the back and the front of it. I, I know what it's supposed to look like in the end. It's just a question of working out the details in between. So I don't get it frustrated. Um, you can spend all your time in the studio. And then from the studio, it has to get to the market or to the, to the new owner. And the only way to get it to the new owner, you have to put in as much time to market your artwork. So it's not just a question of just making the artwork. It's, there's a whole other world out there beyond the artwork that you have to tap into and work just as hard. Even if you don't talk to anybody, you have to go there. You have to see what people are doing and hopefully talk to a few people. And that way you get to understand what's um, on people's mind and what what you can get out and what you can look for. Usually if you have another profession, it's usually a closed profession, you know, you just can't walk into IBM and network with IBM. Uh, but luckily in the art world, you can actually walk into a, a really one of the top line uh, galleries or museum like Fisher Landau and actually network with somebody who's at the top of the game, top of the line. There's a word that either that you have it, you, if you don't have it, you better create it or somehow find it. Is to, is, to, is to have the passion to do it. And when, you, when that passion hits you, it's just, like, you know, it's just like when you fall in love with a woman, you just get a passion to that, that, that woman. You just have to go for her all day long, nonstop. It's just the same thing with art. You just have to, once you get that passion, you do it. Sometimes you see an artist, they're very creative, but they lose the passion to do it. And how do you get that passion back? Um, you just have to, just stop making more art and sooner or later it's just going to give up and come to you. My name is Maurice Jacobs. I was born in Guyana and I'm one of the Guyanese artists. I've been drawing since childhood to present time. As a child I, I, was, um, I only had access to books like John Constable, Michelangelo, Rembrandt, uh, Vermeer, Leonardo, and those old masters. I admired them because of their uh, boldness in color. So I've become familiar with these artists. After drawing for quite some time, I realized I could go a little further, and I wanted to go a little further. So I decided to start painting first in watercolor, and I branch out the oils. As um, I grew up, I found it difficult to, to paint every day because of responsibilities that I took on, such as a family. 
after I retired, I, I went back to painting and I continued painting every day from that time. I'm more on the realistic style of painting. I'm not really an abstract painter, but I, I paint mostly landscape, portraits, still like in a realistic form. So it can relate to the people, the public. And I never really encounter any problem. I enjoy art on the whole, whether it's abstract, whether it's watercolor, or whether it's realistic. In order to be a painter, you have to have a, 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 a wide view of what is happening around you, and you should at least try to understand what other artists are doing. I was inspired to paint because um, I um, had an opportunity to attend a small group uh, that was of artists that was run by Mr. E.R. Burroughs, and he had traveled to England and was familiar with the constable style. So he taught us that, and from that day on, I was hooked on that style. I have a cousin, Stan Cromwell. Stan work is very powerful. It, 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 it reminds me of Dali, and, and his colors are very vivid. A matter of fact, I, I consider him a colorist. My uncle, David Cromwell, now deceased, also was he used to do drawing. He never painted, but he could draw well. And, uh, and an uncle by the name of Stephen Cromwell, who also draw. Most of the Caribbean artists have the idea that they don't have to draw. And drawing is very essential. And they, they take it for granted that men like Picasso and Dali and, and all those um, modern artists never know how to draw, but they, they are mistaken. They all had good schooling, and I think the, the Caribbean artists should do the same. First, they must learn to draw realistically, and then they could branch out to whatever art they need to branch out abstract, surrealism, anything, but they must know to draw properly. And I really hope to accomplish success. I want to be recognized as a, one of Guyanese realistic artists. My name is Claude Hoyt. Um... I'm retired from business. I was in sales and I owned a business school of my own. I work for art instruction schools. This is the way I can express myself and justify my existence by painting. I must have started when I was about eight years old. I, mean, I, I used to get greeting cards come to the house and I was always intrigued by the pictures on these greeting cards, whether it was Christmas or Easter or whatever it was. It caught my eye and I said, oh, hmm. You can do things with this, but that's how I, I got involved initially. Painting, uh, it must have been in my teens because the simple book, Applied Art, gave me all of the foundation that I've acquired to do my own paintings. I'm influenced by people like Constable and um, all of those guys. Those look, when you look at Constable and all those guys, the work that they do, they didn't do it quickly on one Saturday afternoon, you know, canvas racing through to, uh-uh. There's layered stuff. It, it was built like, like you build a, a cathedral, you know? <laughs> you lay the foundation and you build on it and it happens. The Last Supper was on a big wall. He did his calculations, did his drawings and so on, and he built it, put it together layer by layer by layer by layer. And there you get a masterpiece. For me, that's where art belongs. Those people owned it. The problem, I think, with today's artists is that when they are faced with a Rembrandt or a Constable, it, they're so overwhelmed by it and so discouraged by it that they try to invent another way of expressing themselves, which absolutely, in my judgment, has very little value. 
A painting is an image, an image of something. It has to be something that excites you. If it doesn't excite you, <laughs> why bother? I went to Pratt Institute to get a degree in art education. In an environment where that is the kind of thing that everybody was aspiring to. They'd put a nude woman on, on the platform there and say, draw it. And a guy would use geometric lines to express himself and he would get a good grade. Didn't make any sense to me. If it didn't look like what you're looking at and you didn't try to capture something about that object you were looking at that was exciting and you put that on a piece of paper, if you didn't do that, in my judgment, it was not. Fashion changes, but great art is always great art. When it touches you someplace, you get, you get a visceral kind of re reaction from it. If, if it doesn't happen, then it's not art. Abstract expressionism, not for me. If you grew up in the Caribbean, you will not know of any area where abstract art is recognized. We're more expressive, we're more, we're not abstract, we're real. So I left, I, that's, I abandoned art because I realized that I, in America especially, I would not make a living doing it because I couldn't do that kind of stuff. So if you're gonna do art, do art for you. Make you feel good about yourself. When you look at it, you say, I did that, yeah, I got that. Hey, I like that. And then your friends come and look over and say, hey, you, how'd you do that? Yeah. Makes you feel good about you. In, the, in my neighborhood was a friend of mine called, ba whose name was Basil Thompson. Actually, he was a half-brother of mine. And we had the same interests, so we were there to, to impress each other. We lived in, in Burbis, in New Amsterdam. That's where, where I met him. And that's where I did most of my work when I was in Guyana. E.R. Burroughs. He encouraged me to, to join the Guyanese art group. I mean, every, anybody in art in Guyana would know the name E.R. Burroughs. There was a friend of mine, um, Donna Locke. We grew up together, then there's Jerry Barry. Well, he he I, can, I can relate to, and I would recommend strongly that you, you take a look at his work. Really, I do. If you're impressed by what I do, I think you should see his work. Six foot by four foot canvases, you know, with palette knife work, you heavy impasto. I mean, he's, he is really <laughs> totally committed, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I, look, I look at him with admiration, uh, that kind of commitment. Uh, if I were 50 years younger, yes, I would we'd love to have. My name is Jerry Barry, um, fully Jerry Silvanos Barry, presently a teacher and an artist. I uh, pursued this um, dual career all my life. My aunt, um, Aunt Inez, she took up the mantle. She loved art and she wanted me to draw. And then it got the attention of my father that this is really serious, this guy is really serious. So I, I was surrounded by family members and people who really encouraged me. I used to be really furious because um, we used to be grilled to do our three R's, reading, writing, and the arithmetic. And when it came to art, they said, well, do whatever you want, it's free time. I said, well, you know what? I will become an art teacher, and I will teach art. Well, that was a ridiculous statement in those days because there was no such thing as an art teacher. Uh, ten years later, I was really an art teacher. My career started there as an art teacher. When I was fully um, an art teacher at the multilateral schools in um, Guyana. I started to do oil painting. I did a portrait of myself, an oil painting. So I took the palette knife and I squeezed the paint onto the canvas. But what happened there with me is that that was the first time I had used the palette knife to paint. And I started from that palette knife from then on, and that became um, my um, signature style of painting. Vincent Van Gogh um, really touched me because he painted in a similar style that I found myself doing in the palette knife. Practically, my first true influence was uh, my mentor, Edward Rupert Burroughs, who this art school in Guyana was named after. Mr. Burroughs worked a lot with palette knife, and I could never have understood how he got the colors to do that kind of, those kinds of things they were doing. 
It was not until when I actually did my palette knife that I understood what he was doing then. Uh, when people use the word style to me, I'm an educator. I have to talk to children about, about painting. And if a child asks me about style, I will have to find a definition for it. Some people have had it, a difficulty saying, um, determining what style I use. To me, the subject dictates what I will do. I believe the painting and the message that you want to bring to the painting dictates or determines the style of, of painting that you do it. I work with watercolor, oils, acrylics, and leather, and wood. I also carve, wood carve. I'm also a sculptor. I just merge or integrate all of these to get through with what I, what, what I want to do. There is a nostalgic side of me that looks at nature and appreciates the beauty of nature. There are magic moments in life that will never come again. For me, I'm trying to recapture those moments. There is so much beauty in us if we could recognize it and look beyond the ugliness of what's going on around us. I started a series of paintings in which I try to preach and teach that kind of thing. Those are the motivations that drive me. I have paintings that I want to do just to please me and to enjoy my creativity as an artist. Well, most of my, most of the exhibitions I have done so far, I started first in, the, in, in New York with um, AAA Gallery in uh, Parkside Avenue in Brooklyn. I had just arrived in the United States and it was hard to really get people to know who you are. But when I started to make moves to the bigger galleries in Manhattan, I got quite an awakening. And I said, but you know, I'm very sorry to let you know, Mr. Barry, um, we, don't, we don't exhibit work like that. I have the technique, I have the skills. What do you mean work like that? And then he said, um, we don't do ethnic art. Then I realized that what he was telling me you know, he's telling me the truth. We don't do work by you guys to put in our galleries. I've exhibited a lot in and around the United States. One of my sponsors and, and fans and admirers, uh, Marcia Graffi, she had met me in Barbados and had purchased uh, a number of my work to tour with the Caribbean artists today and they were part of a show that toured the United States and Italy. And the, the mayor there even offered me the, um, the key to the city as, as a gesture of appreciation. That was a highlight in my, in my artistic life here in the United States. Artists, in my opinion, can be static or they can move ahead of their time. Now, there are cultural barriers that have been established over ages here. Artists have to be aware of what these barriers are before they can attempt to cross them. Maybe you are your, you are the reason why you are not making the next move. Finding a strategy first is to communicate to people in a language that people can, can receive. One of the reasons why I did the Central Park series I could have done landscapes of Guyana all the way through because that's what's dear and close to me. It's not dear and close to any American. An artist is determined by his particular style, his fingerprint. We Caribbean artists, one of the first things we must do is acknowledge each other for what we are. We should embrace each other as brothers in art. We don't have to be knocking at doors, holding our, hand, holding our hats, begging for favors. We can create our own movement that the door will have to be open for us, either there where the door is closed or it will open a new door for us somewhere else. We must try to learn. Every day the sun raises and the sun goes down, you must ask yourself, what have I learned today? We must be willing to share what we learn. What is the function of art? It is not what you do, but the purpose for which it is used. What exactly are we trying to accomplish in art? 
Artists, in my opinion, are social messengers. We have a mission, and that mission is to better the lives of humanity. All you need is a sincerity. You have the sincerity of spirit. It will come out in your work, and your work will radiate. Our mission is what divides us. If your mission is towards the upliftment of humanity, those doors will fall like the Berlin Wall. It will fall. But once we continue to look and pick of each other in enclaves and we isolate, take it out in little pieces, we will continue to perpetuate the same mess that we are complaining against. I'm Herbert Glenn Bennett. I'm an architect, artist, industrial designer, educator, writer, and other things. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. That's the country I was born in and then migrated to the States in New York. And I've traveled around the world doing all kinds of creative projects in all my different disciplines. At age three, I was given a gift by a relative and I've been hooked ever since by an uncle who was an artist who inspired me. Another relative who was an architect, and I used to be with him, you know, going through projects that he built and whatnot. I kind of stayed out of the art education, art exposure realm, as it were. In studying architecture, I was able to get all the information and the knowledge that I needed to be an artist. Coming from the different backgrounds that I talk about, being eclectic sort of gives me the, the right to kind of explore the feel of all the possible styles, expressions, and everything else. And in addition to that, also blend them into different combinations as well. The work is valid and it stands on its own after it's completed and what have you, but for me, what I get, the joy that I really get out of it is, is the process itself. That sort of spirit of the expression that's captured, it's kind of like cause and effect. You, know, you, you control the cause and the effect is gonna be wonderful. I make myself available to inspiration, let's say. There's a need to express myself. For me, it's always a good, almost litmus test to find out where I am, spiritually, psychologically, even physically. There's a part of me that I can reach doing a, a painting, let's say. Being an artist is one of the most noble professions on this planet Earth. It's almost like we're, we're left on our own to try and figure out the, the marketing systems and the methods that we need to create the exchange. We recognize that and we kind of stop at the point where we don't realize that this is in fact an industry, this is in fact a profession, and not get caught up in the doctor, lawyer, teacher syndrome. Think in terms of community, think in terms of a whole different way of, of a, a kind of social responsibility and, and then everything else economically, community-wise, creative and so on can begin to flow in a very positive direction. Uh, and, and coming through the, the emerging stage of one's career, you get more of the group dynamics going on where at a certain point you begin to see, oh wow, this isn't as different as I thought it was. We really are together. For me, it's always been positive. Anytime I have a show, it's, it's successful. Just to have the show itself means that somebody recognizes that you have something to share and to offer, and, and you can make it a very positive experience because you can't, you can't be wanting to be successful and be hiding in a closet at the same time. Artists by themselves cannot be a business. You're creating a product that's your focus. There's a whole community of professionals needed to make that work become successful. We buy into this idea of, of individuality. That's the, the distraction in a way. When we come to community consciousness and we begin to understand the supporting networks that's needed to make what we do successful, 
everything changes. Different cultures and how they approach things, they have that kind of cultural, economic infrastructure in place. And we're, in a way, now coming into understanding how that all works. The notion of movements is something that we're not familiar with, we don't trust, we don't understand. And it's really about a communication. Networking is nothing more than just people talking to one another, living in a community and sharing and being open to all the possibilities that we, we can explore in making ourselves, you know, a lot more human than we are. Because if we don't do it, we might not get another chance to do it again. And that's what art does. Look for that voice within you. Those are the little nuggets of, of genius and intelligence that if you listen to them, they can direct you into some very unique areas and prepare yourself for your professional career, some disappointment, prepare yourself for being in the trenches and stick to it -iveness is the name of the game. Look for that voice within you. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am a Caribbean artist. You have to love what you're doing. And Caribbean art is valued. Always think that yours is going to be bigger and better. Produce what you got. And be part of the family. This is my interpretation of the Middle Passage. The colors are, are reflecting because the moisture on the floor can actually reflect like water. The slave masters, um, agents are at the top of the ship. And you see I put stairs there, but that the source of, that we look to for our light could very well be the source of our destruction. But these are gathered around each other and they are united in spirit around their prince. They were very important people that were captured like common slaves. We seem to have ignored that fact. The destruction, the culture, human culture that has taken place. He, he sits in dignity like a real prince and his wives. Uh, she's a symbol of, of virtue that was possibly violated on deck. The various manners in which we respond to captivity, to deprivation. But if we all hold together as one and we, we follow dignified leadership, we will solve that problem permanently.